Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Out Positive UK first Zoom question and A event. And uh, we have about 34 members um, online at the moment, logged in. So we're very grateful to Dr. Alistair Greystoke for giving up his valuable free time on a Saturday to answer our questions. Dr. Greystoke, for those of you that don't know, is a consultant medical thoracic oncologist at Newcastle University and the Northern Centre for Cancer Care. Alistair, um, perhaps you could say a few words by way of introduction? Yes, yeah, so um, thanks very much for asking me to come and talk to you. Um, I, uh, it's always a pleasure. I'm a great believer in patient involvement in, in, in uh, lung cancer. It's great to see such a thriving group. Um, uh, so I've uh, been a consultant at Newcastle for about seven or eight years. Uh, I first started treating ALK patients uh, when I was uh, training at the Christie. We were running the profile study looking at crizotinib versus chemotherapy shows how far we've come in those eight years. And then uh, when I moved to Newcastle, we were using Crizostinib's second line. That was the only option we had. Um, I then got involved in the Seritinib studies. So uh, uh, ran the food effects study in Seritinib, which we may want to talk a little bit about. And after that, so I sort of attracted quite a large number of ALK patients in the region into my care for that study. And then when the seritinib stopped, stopped working, I had to start to look for other options for them. So started to look for uh, compassionate access to uh, agents such as brigatinib and then lolatinib. Um, also, as Deborah will be aware, I've done quite a lot of work with NICE trying to get access. So I uh, was involved in both fialectinib and the lolatinib um, appraisals in terms of getting access to those drugs to patients in England. And we can maybe talk about the pros and cons of that process as well as we go forward. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Alistair. So just to remind you, the, the chat facility will be available for the last 10 minutes of the session. Um, so let's get started. And the first question is about electinib. So, um, so one of our members has asked, they're on a reduced dose of electinib because they had an initial uh, reaction, a rash. Would increasing the dose be worth trying again? So it, it, in general, I, I think probably not um a lot will depend on um so if the cancer is under control at that dose i wouldn't normally attempt to dose escalate uh, to go back up the dose again um the doses of the tablets that we use in general when we're doing the early clinical trials we actually often try to push the dose as high as we can and that's based on when we used to develop chemotherapies where we used to push the dose higher and higher and higher until you know, we start to see problems with white cell counts, infections and things like that. And we presumed that the top dose was the best. Now, actually, when you look at the drugs targeting ALK, we may not need to go all the way up to the point where people start to get side effects. And often we don't go quite as far. And so you can get long uh, periods of the drug doing what you want it to do, even at lower doses. OK, um, sometimes if at the point that the drug stops working, uh, we. Uh, if it particularly if it's only in one or two places and particularly if it's in the brain and we can talk about the brain as a potential issue in fact I'm sure we will talk about the brain as a potential issue and if the side effect that you had was not too bad like a relatively minor rash it might be worthwhile just pushing it up for a little bit for a period of time and seeing what happens but in, in my experience when you try that often even if you can tolerate it the length of time that it works is relatively small and you may want to look at changing treatments instead. That's good. And that will be reassuring for a lot of our, our members who are on, actually on a reduced dose mm -hmm. as their maintenance dose. So that's really good to hear that actually there's no reason why that wouldn't be successful for them. So uh, thank you very much. So another question um, we've been asked is what research would be useful to overcome or prevent the mechanism of ALK resistance? And is there any such research like that taking place in the UK? Uh, this 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 is a biggie okay um uh, you know alk resistance is a biggie and i think we probably i'm aware that some of your members will have different levels of expertise than others um so let's start at the very beginning and think about alk so the way i think about it is alk is a switch that shouldn't be turned on because of the fusion it gets turned on that drives the cancer forward what we do with the alk inhibitors very crudely is we put a block on that switch so it's no longer signaling and the cancer is reliant on, on that 
or that drive that the alpha protein is giving it to survive. It's, a, it's trying to grow and, and live in a hostile environment. It shouldn't be able to live there. So if you take away its drive, it, it, it dies. And that's why we see when we give uh, alpha inhibitors, you see the shrinkages very rapidly and often patients feel better very quickly. Okay, so resistance. Resistance can occur in a number of different ways. Uh, and it, 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 ALK is, in my mind, is slightly unusual and that a lot of the resistance, at least to start with, is driven through ALK. So you see these mutations. So the original event is a fusion, losing control of, of, of the protein. But then what you see is mutations that stop your drugs binding, stop your block going into the switch. And that's why in many ways, and again, I, I know we've, we'll probably talk about this, you can move, and we have traditionally moved from one alk inhibitor to the other, and we sort of worked up this ladder of, you know, crizotinib to seritinib to, you know, lectinib to brigatinib to lorlatinib, um, which were able to overcome some of those, what we call gatekeeper mutations. And so you're now at the point where with lectinib, brigatinib, lorlatinib, you've actually got very potent drugs that can go into alk and block it. What then happens is that, you know, you're pushing harder on the cancer and it's going to push back in, in some other way. So at some point it stops you trying to become resistant through ALK and starts to do other things to become resistant. And often those are through turning on other switches that are on, you know, that can drive the cancer forward or by turning on the downstream machinery of ALK. So it's, no, it's still using the same machinery that the ALK is driving through. It's just no longer relying on ALK. Uh, and, and one of the most common ways it does that, uh, or a very common way we've seen resistance coming forward is through another gene that's very commonly mutated in cancers, including lung cancer called KRAS. Okay, and so uh, what you start to see is mutations in other genes. Now, uh, so uh, research. So what do we need to know? Um, so the first thing is we just need to get a better handle on how the cancers become resistant. So a lot of the work to date has been done in laboratories. Uh, a lot of work to date has been done in America. Um, some of it, uh, a lot still uh, has been done on circulating free DNA and liquid biopsies, and we'll come on to that. But whether that accurately represents what's going on in, in, the, in the tumor, if you took a lump out of it, uh, it's difficult to say. Um, and a lot of it still was done in the setting of either patients who are progressing on the, uh, you know, the earlier generation inhibitors, you know, potentially seritinib, electinib, or have worked up through those pathways of, you know, seritinib, crizotinib, electinib, brigatinib, up to lorlatinib. But is that the same mechanism of resistance to a patient who just starts on electinib straight off or starts on lorlatinib straight off? You know, is the cancer still going to become resistant in those ways? So, so the, the, definitely the first thing we need to do is just get a really good idea as to what what happens in patients and it, it, is it always the same thing it, uh, between patients almost certainly not is it even the same thing within a patient if you have two areas of cancer progressing in a patient's cancer are they are they becoming abnormal in the same way and again probably almost certainly not um and, and so i think that will be the first step to my mind the next step then obviously is doing something about it either preventing it or uh, uh, trying to reverse that resistance. And, and, and that is, is gonna become is more problematic. And I think we'll maybe come on to that as well. So what research do we need in the UK? Um, so, uh, well, number one is we need, um, we need a better idea of our outcomes. So we need to know patients, you know, not all our patients are equal. There's different ALK variants. There's different, some of them will have other mutations and other genes, even when they present with their cancer. So how does that impact on treatment in the UK environment? Capture that. How long do you have your ALK inhibitor for? Capture that. How does your cancer become resistant to the ALK, ALK inhibitor? Capture all that. And then, then we've got an idea, then we can start to prioritize what we need to do next and say, well, actually, this is really common. This is the main problem in our outpatients. Let's, let's really focus in on that area. As to what's been done in the UK, I think relatively little at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, and that's, uh, I think partly that's because it's been a really fast moving field. You know, we talked about, you know, I, I started whatever it was 10, 12 years ago, you know, treating patients with crisotin and things have moved so quickly, you know, in terms of the, uh, you know, the agents coming through. It's taken a long time to embed. 
Um, the second, I think, is the perception that um, but between the Americans and the companies that this is all covered. You know that the you, you know the Americans are all you know. Uh, there's some very there's some excellent researchers uh, out there. You know Ross Cabbage, Alice Shaw, who get up in conferences have got these all singing, all dancing ideas, and you're just like, well, how can you even start to compete with that? Um, and also, and you've got the companies coming through with their big phase three studies, and they're collecting all these samples of whether they're actually analysing them. You don't really know. So I think it's very difficult to think as a UK academic and go to Cancer Research UK and say, well, give me a million pounds because I'm going to, you know, revolutionise the outlandscape. landscape. And I'll say, well, the, you know, the Americans or the companies are already doing it. I think one of the challenges a, num a number of our members have, uh, have, um, have voiced is, is that we're very grateful that, this, that the research is being done in the States. And that's great news because ultimately it will trans translate to you know, drug availability in the UK. One of the, the areas that, is, that it does preclude us from is around accessing trials when the standard treatments have run out. And I think that's where the, the big um, gap is for, for UK patients. Um, we see that on the worldwide site that I, I'm sure you're aware of um, for outpatients and a lot of them once the latinib stops stops working they enter into different trials um and there's one at the moment that's being trialed with uh, with lolatinib um and a ship 2 inhibitor um for example um and so that that's what that's a challenge for for our members not being able to access that but actually um, on that subject of the ship 2 and, and the lolatinib trial i just wonder what your thoughts are on um any of these trials that are taking place showing a promise for us? Yeah, um, I, I just quickly come back to that American thing, you know, so a lot of these trials are being run phase one, phase two, so which is establishing the dose and the early efficacy. Um, I, 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 and that, and that is, is a problem because more and more they are being done in America, partly because um, the ship one, two, one is slightly different because obviously that's funded by our positive, but you know, the commercial studies, they want the American investigators engaged early on. Uh, it makes it easier when they're going through to the FDA if it was done in America and they get the people, you know, it gets into ASCO because it's a big American investigator. Um, also, traditionally, and this is a problem, uh, UK trials are slow to set up because of the bureaucracy and they want their trials to run very quickly over a year and it takes a year to get, you know, we're very good when we got them up and running, we recruit very well, but it can take a year for us to get up. Anyway, sorry, you asked about SHIP2. Um, <laughs> so um, SHIP2, I think, is one of the more interesting areas. Um, so. SHIP2 is a sort of what we call an adapter protein. And when I was talking before about some of that downstream machinery, so this is SHIP2 is very involved in the downstream machinery. So ALK is on the cell surface, it's a switch on the cell surface. It needs the signal down through the cell to do something in the nucleus, to tell the nucleus to grow, to divide, spread, to make proteins that enable it to do all the horrible things we don't want it to do. And so it has to signal down for a, a, a series of signals of which KRAS is, is one of them. And SHIP2 is, is, is one of the key proteins that's involved in that process for a number of the different switches, uh, including ALK, including KRAS, including some of the other ones that may be mutated. Um, the problem before is it's, it's been one of these proteins, and so it's been one of these genes, well, proteins, yeah, um, that's been very difficult to drug. Um, so it's, it's something that we've been trying for about 20 or 30 years, and we just couldn't get a tablet that worked. But it does now look like there are some really good tablets coming through and they they look to be interesting not only in ALK but in a number of other cancer types you know there's the KRAS mutation we talked about so I, I think there's a real drive to to bring these tablets forward and I think the potential interaction with lorlatinib is very interesting um I, I, I will be interested to see the toxicity coming through because, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, lolatinib is still is, is still reasonably tolerated, but it's probably the least well tolerated of the ALK inhibitors, partly because of its potency. Um, and as you start to add in other drugs, that can start to lead to additional side effects, um, be it either because you're pushing up the levels of the lolatinib in the body or because you're, you know, you're impacting on two organs, you know, like the liver often might be a problem, you know, the liver has to deal with the lorlatinib, it has to also deal with the ship to inhibitor. So it'd be very interesting to see the toxicity, but I think 
the biology is very, very interesting. You know, the, the, um, in mice, for what it's worth, the, the, the two drugs work very well together. Um, whether that will translate to patients, I guess we don't really know, but I think the concept is, is, is fascinating. Yeah, one, one definitely to watch. Another one that people are talking about are the is the out vaccine. How optimistic are you that um, that that will come through to fruition? Uh, I'm less optimistic about that one, um, but maybe that's because I'm, I, I you know uh, I've always been slightly worried about about vaccines, um, and, I, and I don't know if that's because I'm not really an immunologist. You know, we all know how important the immune system is in terms of uh, dealing with stopping cancers, forming in the first place, treating cancers. Um, there has been some very interesting data shown uh, that some patients with alk lung cancer have antibodies against the alk protein. Relatively uncommon, but some do. Uh, and some suggestion that those patients might do better. Um, and so the question then is, well, you know, can you boost that immune system? So can you give patients who have alk antibodies, can you use those to try and, you know, drive forward efficacy? Um, and if patients don't have them, could you use the vaccine so that patients do produce them? So uh, you know, I think um, the thing that makes me think that it might be interesting is that uh, there's that little bit of biology, you know, underpinning it. So it's, it's built in an observation of patients, which I always like, you know, rather than mice. Um, the antibody seems to target a different bit of the alpha protein than the switch. Uh, so if uh, the cancer is mutating the switch to get around your drugs, well, actually, the antibody may be targeting something else. So you're, you're hitting the, the protein in two different bits. Um, and the third bit is that actually in a normal person, ALK doesn't do very much. So you could have an antibody and it shouldn't cause much in the way of side effects. But, you know, cancers are really, you know, they're sneaky things. And one of the first things they learn how to do is to hide from the immune system. So whether a vaccine is going to be able to get around that I, I have slight worries I have to say. Okay thank you industry. very much <laughs> I'm not sure that's what our members wanted to hear but sorry, um, sorry, you know, I think we'd uh, rather the uh, truth. <laughs> I'd be delighted to be proved you know in five years time so so you know if you told me 10 years ago that we'd be using the immune system like you know immunotherapies to target cancer I would have laughed in your face I've been wrong so many times so um, uh, yeah I'd be delighted to come back in five years time after you know it's um, Mark Arwald who does a lot of this work gets up and he says you know we've got outstanding results in you know the phase one and I will I will happily come back and uh, say how wrong I was. Okay, all right, we'll hold you to that one then. <laughs> and hopefully uh, you, it is an occasion when you're wrong. Okay, um, I'd like to go back to a question <clears throat> that we've had from someone from, um, again, on an election nib. Um, and I'm just, I'm gonna read this one out. So, because um, I can't remember all these questions off my heart. So mm -hmm. my husband is on elective and we were told about numerous TKI, TKIs and that we would move from one to the next. I'm beginning to understand that this isn't the case. Mm -hmm. um, do, I, uh, do I understand that lalatinib would be the next step um, after, um, after electinib? Mm -hmm. So yes, um, I, I sort of talked about how it'd been a very rapidly evolving field where we moved from, you know, crizotinib to seritinib as, as the first, and that was the first second generation inhibitor that we had that came through. And then electinib came, came through and, and, and seritinib had some issues and it's basically blown away. And I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it unless anyone wants me to, because it, it, its share of the market is basically gone. And then electinib came along uh, and first did a trial in post Crizotinib, but then did, uh, did a first line study against crizotinib. So half the patients got crizotinib and the other half got electinib. It was a study called Alex, um, and it basically blew the market away because uh, the length of disease control in that study was far better than had ever been seen, but with crizotinib or, or, or seritinib. And I can remember I was standing in, in, in ASCO listening to it. Everyone was very impressed, and actually an ALK patient got off at the at the back of the room and said, look, I'm an outpatient. This means the world to me to see these, these trial data coming through, um, which was great. So um, that uh, that's then basically when it became available in the NHS has come to dominate the market, um, although brigatinib has now recently been made available in the first line setting. So then the question is, well, what, what, what do you do when you progress on electinib? And uh, so lolatinib has lots of data uh, both preclinically, but also clinically, mainly in, in, in small cohorts, showing that 
um, it, it, it works in patients who have had multiple lines of ALK inhibitors before, including electinib. So they, their trials, they included 20 patients that had, had one ALK inhibitor, 20 patients that had two, the numbers aren't right, but that's sort of more than 20 patients that had three, 20 patients that had four ALK inhibitors. Uh, basically showed that the, limp, the, the number of patients who cancer shrunk was all about the same. Uh, and the length of time that the cancer shrunk for was all about the same, regardless of how many ALK inhibitors you'd had before. Uh, so, um, and that subsequently has driven uh, NICE to make lorlatinib available in a post-electinib space. But she's quite right that unfortunately there is nothing else that NICE have approved uh, that will, in terms of TKIs after electinib. And, um, you know, one of the questions is, uh, so you've got electinib and brigatinib that have relatively similar first line data. Is there any uh, benefit in moving from one to the other? And the short answer to that is I, I, I don't know. Um, I've done quite a lot, as I mentioned, of crisotinib to serotinib to brigatinib to lorlatinib. I haven't had many patients that have gone electinib to brigatinib or vice versa. There's, there's not really very much data out there that I've seen. Um, and I'm not sure how effective that would be, but certainly in NICE, that's not allowed and uh, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be funded either way to go from electin to brigatinib or vice versa. The only time it would be funded is that, is that um, NICE have this sort of three month rule, which I actually quite like, which is to say you can have three months on a tablet. And if you're really struggling with toxicity, as long as your cancer's not progressed on it, your oncologist can switch you to another one. It, another one of the first line options. So if you start an electinib and you're struggling with your rash rather than dose reducing or something like that, you could actually have switched to brigatinib um, if, if both are available. Okay, and um, looking at looking at trying to space things out, is there, you know, what are your thoughts on maybe adding in chemo or radiation when you get progression on electinib before you move over to something like lolatinib? What are your thoughts on on that? Yeah, so, um, okay, uh, I think there's an, a, a number of different issues there. So um, uh, let's talk about radiotherapy first in terms of rescuing, uh, rescuing the length of time that you're on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So um, if you have what we describe as oligo progression, which is that your cancer is all shrunk down, is working everywhere and then one or two areas start to come up then definitely the advice should be if at all possible you should do something to those areas of disease to try to extend your length of time on that tablet okay even if you've got the, the tablet as another option now uh, the, well do we have evidence for that <laughs> uh that's challenging but i think that i think we all think that's right okay um so the, there's, an, uh, there's a number of questions that, that then leads on to. So, okay, it's one or two areas of disease. Uh, well, what about if it's three or four? What about if it's the brain? What if some areas haven't shrunk down? Uh, you know, what about if it's five or six areas? So um, that, that then becomes very challenging to work out what the right thing to do is. What about if your local therapy is gonna cause quite significant side effects? Um, is it still the right thing to do? So there is a study running at present time called HALT. Um, so this is, the, okay, no, I'm gonna go back a second. So um, in terms of radiotherapy, there is what's this called the standard external beam radiotherapy where you can give pretty high doses over often, often over a number of different treatments, over a number of treatments sometimes if you wanna get decent doses in. Sometimes one, sometimes four, sometimes five, sometimes 20. Um, and that certainly can be enough to um, kill cancer cells in that area, but certainly set them back a long way, which is, guess what you're trying to do in this scenario, try and knock them back, okay, because you want to get longer on your tablet. There is now this concept of what's called stereotactic radiotherapy, and I suspect a number of your members uh, may have experienced this, particularly when we're talking about the brain, which again, we might come back to. It can also be used in other areas of the body. And what it is, is very tightly focused, very high levels of radiotherapy that you hope are high enough to definitely kill the cancer cells in that area. 
but that it does have limitations in terms of the size that you can deliver to, you know, you have and 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 uh, you know where you can deliver it to because you're giving very high doses. And if there's a normal organ close by, you could do permanent damage to it if it gets irradiotherapy. Okay. Um, this is one of the areas of technology that is becoming increasingly used in the UK, and one of the things that the government is investing in. But it started off very much in specialist centres. And, and, and there's a wide range of expertise in the country. So I guess we may talk about postcode access later on, but the different centers will have different expertise in using these technologies. Um, and also there are, it is very expensive. It takes a lot of time and effort to even treat one area because somebody, a physicist has to sit down and work out exactly how they're gonna get all the dose into that, org, into that area of tumor without any, anywhere else. Yeah, into, without hitting any other organs. Okay. Um, so it is an increasing area. The reason why I'm talking so much about it is there is a trial uh, at present time in the UK, which is sponsored by Cancer Research UK, which your members may be eligible for. And that's what's called the HALT study. And that says that if you have had a response to your tablet and you are progressing in some areas of disease, you can have stereotactic radiotherapy to those areas of disease. But it is a randomized study, so only two out of every three patients get the stereotactic surgery. You don't get to choose, you get told. And the other person carries on doing whatever their oncologist otherwise would do. Um, and outside that trial and outside the brain, stereotactic radiosurgery is not funded in the UK. So if you have a liver met growing and you're an ALK patient, you can go into hold and you could have stereotactic radiotherapy to that liver if you're one of the two out of three. You could have standard radiotherapy to that liver if your oncologist thinks it's the right thing to do, but you can't routinely have stereotactic radiosurgery to that liver. Um, and you can argue about the pros and cons about it, but that's partly because we just don't know how good it is um, in terms of you know maintaining how long it will give you on that tablet, what impact it will have on quality of life, what toxicity is. And so that's why we're doing it within the trial. Um, most um, there's a number of centers around and certainly well we're not running at Newcastle but I've sent two two three patients down to uh, Sheffield which is our nearest center to have that done okay that's a long answer even to talk about radiotherapy sorry <laughs> that's, um, what about spacing out, out the before chemo? To chemo? sorry sorry Come so we talked about, so the other part of the question was, well, could you, could you space out between electinib and latinib with chemo? Would, is, is that a, an option? Yeah, um, so that's a very good question. I, I think it's not allowed in the NHS. I think lolatinib is only if you're chemo naive. It's, it's certainly something I've thought about um, because the concern is once you come off lolatinib, um, you, you know, you, you have been talking about chemotherapy or chemotherapy immunotherapy, and I'm sure we're going to talk about those options as well. And it does sound like a nice idea, doesn't it? You know, you give your lectinib, you stop, you know, become progressive, you kill back some of the more resistant clones, mm -hmm. and you get longer from your lolatinib because, you know, lolatinib is very effective at shrinking the cancer down, but in general, the period of length you get with lolatinib is far less than you would get if you, you know, with your lectinib, or that you, if you use lolatinib first line, you know, because there's been a study there. So I, I think it's very, um, it's a very interesting idea. How patients would feel about coming off a tablet to go into chemotherapy when they have another tablet as an option, I don't know. Um, but yeah, equally, I've, I, I believe the wording, and I'd have to check, and I can check after this meeting or when you're doing a chat afterwards. I think to access lolatinib, you're not allowed to have had chemotherapy before, but you can probably remember as much as I do in that one. <laughs> okay, right. Thank you very much. Um, when people have progressed, you and you've mentioned you've come, you've touched upon this in terms of people progressing uh, on lolatinib and what are the options after that. Um, some people talk about immunotherapy. I wonder if you can touch upon that um, as an option for out patients. Yeah. So um, there's two ways that an out patient can potentially access immunotherapy in the NHS. Um, so the one is when you when you come off your lolatinib, there is a combination of four drugs that is funded in the NHS, and you'll hear this called different things. It's sometimes called ABCP, 
which I'll explain, or it's sometimes called the Iron Power 150 Regimen because that was one of the trials that was first used. But most clinicians, I think, will call it ABCP. A, that is four drugs that include chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and a drug that targets the tumor blood supply. Okay, so it gives two chemotherapies, carboplatin and paclitaxel. And there's some issues of that that we'll come back to. It gives immunotherapy and the, and the antiandrogenic. And then you have, within the NHS, you have four cycles with four all four drugs. And then you can drop down to just the immunotherapy and the, uh, the drug targeting the tumor blood vessels. And you can stay on this for up to two years, provided it's working. And at two years, the funding stops. So that's the number one way that they can access it. I'm going to come back to that and I'm just briefly going to touch on the second way um, because I would not advise that people do this. But the second way is that you can have chemotherapy by itself. Carboplatin and pemetrexid would be the one most commonly used in, in, in England. And then you can have single agent immunotherapy by itself afterwards. That's that's funded as well. The reason why I would say that I would not recommend that is, is most of the research suggests that if you give immunotherapy by itself to, a, to an outpatient, the chances of response are relatively low. Having said that, I have had some outpatients who have responded to single agent immunotherapy, and I know of others that have. Mainly, um, I, I know of one or two who had it as a first line treatment when people didn't know they had ALK because, and they actually responded to it. So, you know, the exception proves, proves the rule or whatever, but in general, I, I would try and not use single agent immunotherapy in an ALK patient. So, going back, so, but that is there as a funded pathway. The issue about using the four drugs. Um, so number one, the carboplatin and paclitaxel, we're told what doses we have to use. So we have to start at top dose. So normally as an oncologist, if, my patient, if I'm a little bit worried about my patient and how they'll tolerate the first treatment, I'll sometimes take like 20% off the first dose of one of the drugs, just see how they go. And then we can always push up. We're not allowed to do that for that regimen. We have to give top dose first cycle, um, NHS rules. Second thing about it is paclitaxel does make you lose your hair. Uh, which can be a big issue for some some patients. It does grow back, um, but uh, it, it, it does make you it can make you lose your hair. Um, third issue is it takes quite a long time to administer that, that regimen, the paclitaxel. So, uh, you need to have quite a lot of pre meds before because otherwise you can react to it, and it takes about three hours to give. So with all those drugs, it takes about five or six hours to actually administer that regimen, and that's a long day for a patient. And the last thing. Um, is which uh, is that there's some suggestions uh, from some of the lab work that pemetrexid may be a particularly good chemotherapy for ALK patients. Um, and that's not used in that regimen. You do then have pemetrexid as an option as your next line of treatment. So if the ABCP doesn't work, you then can then use the pemetrexid in the next line, but you're not using one of the drugs, one of the chemotherapy drugs that's for thought to be particularly useful in our patients in, in, by using that quadruplet regimen. So, so there are issues around it. Um, the last thing to say is that, yeah, as I said, it was based on the iron power uh, trial, which included, um, it was a lung, it, was a, it wasn't an ALK um, lung cancer trial, it was a lung cancer trial, but it included a small number of ALK patients. I think it was somewhere between 10 and 15. So, and, and this was, a, you know, a thousand patient study. So, um, yeah, it's sort of extrapolated from that. So we don't still know quite how well our patients do on it. You know, I've, I've had some some success with it, but also some failures with it, I have to say. Okay, okay. Um, looking at, you know, you, you made reference earlier on about how the, the fantastic advances that have been made in a very short period of time um, in the world of ALK. You know, um, how do you think treatment's gonna change over the next five years? Yeah, um, so I, 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 I'm, I think probably it's going to be those mechanisms of resistance. Um, you know, I think um, um, I think probably with lorlatinib and some of the new ones coming through, uh, repotrectinib and stuff like that, we're probably as far forward as hitting the ALK space as possible. Um, 
so I think there's two there's two main things that I can see coming forward. So number one, which I think is the, the next thing, is going to be these combinations, rational combinations. So SHIP2 inhibitors, MET inhibitors, you know, combining uh, probably individualizing therapy on the basis of mechanism of resistance. Um, the next thing, and I think this may be potentially interesting for outpatients, is going to be using what's called adaptive T cell therapies. And that's so um, immunotherapy at present, what we mean by immunotherapy is um, so can cancer cells produced, produce a signal saying, I'm not here, leave me alone. And all we do with an immunotherapy is we, we block that look, away, that look away signal. We say to the immune system, go and attack. OK, so we're relying on your body's own normal white cells to go and attack. And whether they do or not is, is quite challenging. Increasingly, what we're trying to potentially doing is um, taking a patient's white cells out, potentially genetically modifying them so that you re repurpose them to target ALK, for example, and then giving them back to the patient with a small amount of chemotherapy to sort of make space to get rid of the other lymphocytes. Um, and that's sort of, uh, so you may, some of your members may have heard of CAR-T. And so that's increasingly being used for hematological malignancies where you use it to attack a protein on, 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 on the leukemia cells because it's hematological malignancies. We're starting to do that in, in solid tumors. Um, it's more challenging than doing it in, in hematological tumors for a, a number of reasons, getting, getting the, the, the new, your new genetically engineered immune cells into the tumor can be quite challenging. Making sure they don't attack the rest of the body can be quite challenging. But actually, again, for ALK, that may not be too bad because as I said before, ALK doesn't have much of a normal role in, in, in patients. So I can see maybe five years down the line, it wouldn't surprise me if we have some form of CAR T therapy being tried for ALK. Interesting. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to switch back to, uh, I think, a relatively simple question for yourself okay. now. And um, <laughs> someone's asked the uh, question. I think those were a few quite taxing questions, really. Um, but um, looking at what advice you can give on the best foods to take with TKI for maximum maximum absorption. If you read the SPC, um, especially for Electinib, it talks about um, taking the tablets with a high fat meal. And I think there's a lot of confusion as to what does that what does that mean? What does that look like? Yeah, it, 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 we do food studies with, uh, with, with patients sometimes and it, it, they're, it, they're actually pretty horrible, the, the stuff that we have to give patients to get the high fat food in. So it's, it's, it's like your fried eggs and your toast with loads of butter on it and stuff like that. Um, you know, as I said, we did the serotonin food study where you had, the poor patients had to do that. You know, they had to, it, it, it wasn't your standard bowl of special K. It was, you know, a couple of bacon rashers, a fried egg, uh, toast, uh, you know, with full fat butter on it. it. It didn't look particularly great, I have to say. Um, again, I, I think it's unlikely that it has a major, you know, the, the one that I had a major impact on was serotonib, um, which which we did the food study on and found that with food, you know, you could take a lower dose and it was much better tolerated, which is why they changed the label. Um, I, I think, it, you know, it's hard enough taking the, whatever it is, four tablets for electinib anyway, the, you know, without trying to force it down on a, a bowl of grease. I would go for a healthy balanced diet. Yeah, you know, uh, don't, you know, don't try and starve the cancer because, you know, people, there's some diets out there that are proposed by some people on the internet about, you know, not using any sugar or not using any fat because the cancer will feed on it. I'm, there's no evidence of that at all, I'm afraid. Uh, our bodies are very good at maintaining, you know, their own blood sugar level, uh, and the cancer is very good at taking the sugar in. Um, but I would, I would just go for, you know, eating sensibly rather and not worrying too much about it. Quite frankly. Excellent. That's very reassuring to hear. So, and I, especially for from the, I would say the majority of our members who do try and stay as healthy as possible, um, and it has come up several times that it, it's counterintuitive to to eat this the, a high fat meal. So that's great. Thank you very much for that one. Um, looking at um, another question, which going back to crozotinib, because I know not many people are still on it, but we still have one or two members that, that have done incredibly well. And so um, we've got one member who's been on crozotinib for many years. Um, and if they get progression in only one or two areas, um, do you think they'll get treated with radiation or do you think 
they would get moved to another um, TKI now? That's a very interesting question, isn't it, actually? Mm. Yeah, no, that, that, that's fascinating. Um, I think it'd still be very tempting to follow first principles. And if somebody is only progressing one or two areas, you, you, you deal with those one or two areas. Um, you know, there's always been the tendency for people to jump ship to the newest newfangled thing. But I think actually I, I, I would be tempted to, to stick as long as you can and save, you know, uh, I guess in that situation, that patient can access brigatinib after crizotinib that is funded. Um, so and save the brigatinib for afterwards because you never quite know what that's going to do. Um, so yeah, no, Great. I, I, I would stick. Lovely. I think that's um, our um, our member will be very pleased to hear that. Um, I won't give their name out, but um, I can see them smiling uh, <laughs> from here. <laughs> so that's good news. Okay. Um, under what circumstances would you recommend whole brain radiation? I think that this no, okay. This is an this is an interesting one, isn't it? Um, I, I, I think it's it, it's so. Okay, well, let's go back to, I've, I've mentioned the brain a few times. So let's just go back again to first principles. So um, brain disease is very common in, unfortunately, in our lung cancer. So why that is, I still nobody's quite explained to me, but very common as a site of presentation. Um, very common, unfortunately, to develop some uh, disease at some point. So the first thing that I would say, and I think you've reflected this in your good practice, is that patients should have their brain imaged and repeatedly imaged, certainly every time the cancer starts to grow. Um, I would, there is some data out there, mostly derived with EGFR mutant disease that also have problems with the issue of brain disease, that, that in retrospective series, patients who have had Tyrosine kinase inhibitor and stereotactic radiotherapy up front do slightly better than those that have had tyrosine kinase inhibitor plus whole brain radiotherapy up front do slightly better than those who have tyrosine kinase inhibitor alone. But that's retrospective series and there's studies ongoing now looking at this area, particularly in the EGFR mutant disease. I would not recommend having whole brain radiotherapy up front. Uh, e, e, uh, uh, and the reason being A is that the tablets have got a very good chance of shrinking things down. OK, um, including in the brain, even if you use, even in the old days, crisotinib used to do it. And certainly now we're using lectinib and brigatinib and lovatinib. They've got very good chances of shrinking the, the, the disease in the brain down. The other thing is that the toxicity of whole brain radiotherapy is not insignificant. And not only in the short term. So in the short term, it's quite fatiguing, but that's fine. You know, most of your members will be younger and, and can manage it compared to some of the other patients who get whole brain radiotherapy. Um, but in the long term, uh, I think it does lead to, uh, it, it does have impacts on things like memory and level of function if you talk to my patients. And, you know, we are hoping for our outpatients now that their prognosis will be many years. And I think over time, that potential impact of having whole brain radiotherapy is not insignificant. So I certainly wouldn't use it up front. Ideally, um, if the cancer is becoming resistant in the brain, we would like to use stereotactic radiotherapy. And that's partly because A, I think it's more effective you're getting higher doses in, and B, it spares normal brain tissue. There may be times when it is not possible to give stereotactic um, uh, radiotherapy to all sorts of disease. And that can be partly because of where it is, it can be due to uh, further treatments. And in that situation, I think it would be reasonable certainly to think about it, okay? But I think it's a, it's a decision that needs to be taken very carefully. And it's, you know, I, 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 I know we might sort of talk about second opinions and stuff like that. It's, it's, one, it's certainly an area where there is still different expertise around the country. And it's, it's one where you might want to ask the question of another center before you go down as to whether stereotactic radiotherapy might be possible. Because some places will say, oh, we're only doing three or five areas of disease. Some areas will say, well, actually, no, we'll treat up to 20 centimeter cubed. Some areas will do, so, you know, it, 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 there is variation around the country as people get more expertise in this area. So definitely, um, I would think about that. Um, 
so I don't know if that's answered the question. I, I, I think there are situations where it should be used, um, but not up front and not until stereotactic radiosurgery has already been explored as an option. That's very useful to know, because I know that some of our members have been have been told they've got multiple sites of progression in the brain and they have been told there's too many um, for whole brain. But what you're saying is maybe check that out at a, with a centre of excellence for stereotactic to see whether it, that is the case or not before yeah. progressing with the whole brain. Uh, yeah, I, I, and you don't even necessarily, you know, need to go see them. And often you can just ask for your scans. Certainly for something like that, you can ask for your scans to go to be discussed by them virtually. And your oncologist will send them a, a letter, sending down, uh, uh, send down your scans, and they'll look at them. Sometimes they'll need a better scan uh, done, um, but often they'll be able to look at them and say, "Yeah, no, this is fine." Often, sometimes not. You know, so. The other question that I come across, which I guess comes to this, so um, if you have multiple ones and it's getting difficult for radiotherapy, and I've had, had this happen before, is, and you've got a TKI switch. So you, you've got your lectinib, you're progressing in 10 or 12 areas in the brain. And you know that with lorlatinib, you've got a good chance of shrinking things back down again. Should you have stereotactic radiotherapy then? I think up to a certain extent, yes, if they can do them to try to maintain the electinib. Should you have whole brain radiotherapy then? I think probably not. I would go for the latinib as still the less toxic regimen. The question then arises, and I think this is a really difficult one, is so you, you, there's the 10, the 10 brain meds and they were too big. Maybe not say too many, because I think too many is often too wrong, but too big, or one was too big. You, sh you shrink the eight or 10 down and you're left with two or three that you can still see. Do you give stereotactic radiotherapy at that point to those two or three that you can still see, even though they're shrunk down? Or do you watch them very carefully and hit them the first moment it comes up? And we don't know this, that answer at all. Um, you know, I think there's increasing, you know, I think there's an increasing rationale to think well, maybe we should. And I'm certainly starting to talk that over with my brain team. And every time I ask the question, they go, we don't know. <laughs> so, uh, and, I, and I don't know either. Um, but then you worry that, well, when, when the Latin stops working, you're going to go back to them and they're going to say, well, well it's too big now. Um, so, you know, increasingly, it feels like I, uh, and I'm starting to push them a little bit harder and say, well, actually, maybe, you know, come on, guys, you know, I've, I've, I've done my switch. I've shrunk things back down. What do you reckon? Um, but this is one of the areas where things are evolving very quickly in terms of our, our, our knowledge. Um, so I may be, it may be another thing in five years come time that I have to come back and say I'm wrong. Okay. All right. We uh, will wait and see. We actually, I can't believe how um, how quickly we're getting through time. So I'm going to see if I can ask some quick fire questions. Um, that's always um, uh, it might be difficult. I might might regret that <laughs> with the answers, but we'll see. Um, uh, here, um, it turns out I am an identical twin. Will my twin get this disease as we have as we have identical genes? And that relates to another question where they say, "How do they know for certain that out positive lung cancer is not hereditary?" So it's two for yeah. one there. We don't we don't think it is. Um, the, uh, there's no real evidence so far. And the other thing is that because ALK so ALK it, oh, it doesn't have much role to play um in your normal um development when you're an adult but it's got an extensive role when you're an embryo and i think if it was abnormal at that point you'd really be running into problems um so so yeah no, it, it, we don't think it is hereditary um you know there's some suggestion with egfr mutants that you know we know that certain uh, ethnicities are more likely to get it there's some suggestion that certain ethnicities are more likely to get out uh, and we're just starting to understand that. Um, but no, you know, I don't think your identical twin will get it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I really don't, and we don't think it's hereditary. Um, having said that, you know, we've only known about alkaline cancer for 10 years. Um, I very much hope I won't be proven wrong with this. I don't think there's good reason to think there is, but uh, as far as we know, it's not hereditary. Okay, all right. Because we're running out of time, I'd like to ask, because um, a question that came up many times is around the question around scans mm -hmm. um, and the term. Um, so there's a lot of um, variation amongst our members in the frequency of follow up scans mm -hmm. and which areas of the body should be scanned. Um, so if I can start off with those two, that would be 
Yeah. Um, so at, at baseline, everything you know. You should have a CT scan of your chest and abdomen, and I, I believe you should have an MRI of your brain if you're prepared to accept the knowledge that you will lose your driving license if they find a small insignificant thing. And I absolutely hate that. I have had so many arguments with the DVLA, but I've not won that argument yet. And you, your members should take that on because I'll listen to you more than I will. Um, and if there's, there's cancer in the brain, it should be then followed up. Um, what you should do next, I, th I think, is, is more difficult, and there's no right answer. Um, so certainly, you should establish response probably at two months, and you should probably establish maximum response, and so do another one a couple of months afterwards. Whether there is any benefit in then doing scans every couple of months after that is is more difficult to know, um, or whether you should wait for symptoms. I think increasingly, if we're saying, well, if there is one or two areas of disease that are progressing, we're going to treat them uh, rather than doing a switch. And I think there is the argument. The, the argument about not scanning regularly is you say, well, you wait till symptoms because you're going to stay on your tablet for as long as possible and you're only going to change if you get symptoms. So we'll, we'll do the scan when you get your symptoms. But the, the argument is, well, if you're saying, well, we're going to look for one or two areas and we're going to blade those areas. And I think you do need to follow it more closely. Relative. Okay. Okay, and in terms of what's the difference, some members are asking the question, what's the difference between CT and PET scans? Yeah, so uh, CT scan is uh, just x-rays, just taking a picture. Um, in a PET scan, you'll get an injection of radioactive glucose, and that will then go to, if a cancer cell is taking up glucose, then it will shine up bright. Issues are, and you, they normally do a crude CT scan at the same time. It's not got as good resolution to show where the glucose is going. A couple of issues with um, PET scans are, so number one, your brain takes up glucose all the time, so you can't see anything in the brain. Your liver takes up a little bit as well, so it's more difficult to see stuff in the liver. Um, and if you are on a TKI and it's, it's, it's switching off, then it may, even if it's starting to grow very slowly, it may not take up glucose. Certainly I've got a ROS1 patient at the moment, we know his cancer is slowly growing on CT scans. We've seen it over about a year, but on PET scans, it's just completely quiet because it, it, there's so little activity, so little metabolism going on. That's interesting because a lot of people, you, can't, you don't get PET scans routinely on, on, on the NHS mm. and they feel that, um, that, that, that the CT scans aren't as good mm. as PET scans. Um, so that's actually quite reassuring to uh, to hear. Yeah, if you're um, thinking about having ablative treatment, so normally if you've seen one or two areas on the CT scan, we will normally do a PET scan, uh, partly to see well, to say well, is there st other stuff going up? So there's no point you know using radiotherapy with its potential side effects going after these two areas. If on a PET scan you'd find another five or six areas, okay. So then I think it is helpful, and um, uh, but yeah, you just need to be. Uh, it, 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 there are issues with doing it and with routine PET scans. Uh, you know, yeah, they're not funded. Would I find them helpful? I'm not sure I would, um, quite frankly. Um, they're very useful as an adjunct to CT scans, and I would prefer having the availability to use them when I need to. I sometimes have to cobble up reasons while I need to do one. You know, that's just got a long line, but anyway, I'll admit to that. Um, but yeah, just doing a PET scan every three months isn't going to help. Okay, right, lovely, brilliant. Um, in terms of um, following progression, would you recommend a biopsy to look for a mutation given the current position in the UK? Yeah, um, I, I still think it's worthwhile, um, even though, you you know, as we talked, you're basically moving from either lactinib or brigatinib to lorlatinib, you know, so actually does the profile help or not? Um, there is a couple of reasons why I would say it. Number one, there were rare cases, um, including I think one done in London, where the ALK changed from a non-small cell lung cancer to a small cell lung cancer. And there we wouldn't want to change. We'd want to give you chemotherapy instead. So that's very rare, but it is reported. Um, the other reason is that the, there have been reports of other fusions coming along. So ALK is a fusion, and as well as having the ALK fusion, the cancer brings along a new fusion, a new switch. And some of these have tablets for. So, for example, there are reports. In fact, I've seen one of these of a RET fusion coming along as a mechanism of resistance to ALK. And I had one of these patients myself, unfortunately, several years ago before. But we now have RET inhibitors, and you can sometimes get compassionate access to them. So, or them even probably not trials, but you know, you might want to think about whether you bring two drugs together in that situation. Very challenging in the NHS. You know, I know people will be on the American websites where they chuck things in left right and center for better or for worse 
Um, that's very difficult to do on the NHS, um, and we probably don't have to. That's a that's a pub discussion, and when next year when we can all sit down and have a drink together as to whether that's the right thing or the wrong thing. Oh, I look forward to that. <laughs> I don't know who's buying. Um, there's quite a few of us. <laughs> so, Not me. <laughs> it could be an expensive round for you. <laughs> but here we are. Um, I wonder if you could explain um, to, uh, to us in terms of tumour markers, what they are and what they're used for. Yeah. So um, tumour markers are normally cancer-associated proteins. So they're normally proteins that... Uh, Often they're proteins that we produce as an embryo, but we we don't um, produce anymore when we're uh, an adult. And again, because cancers are sort of reverting in some ways to an embryo, similar in embryo, they're growing and dividing things. They sometimes start to produce these these proteins. So um, you'll hear the classic one is called uh, carcinio embryonic antigen CEA, uh, commonly produced by bowel cancers. And there's about three or four of them out there. Um, uh, CA125, CA153, these are all just proteins that shouldn't normally be produced in high levels in your body and can sometimes be produced by cancers. And I certainly, I spoke to Ross Cavage a couple of years ago and he says he, he checks them regularly on his patients. Um, most of them aren't known to be excreted heavily in, in lung cancer. They can be excreted in a small amount, so they certainly can be elevated. Um, I have one or two of my patients who have asked me to check them. I do them, you know, they're cheap. Nobody asks, nobody objects too much in terms of labs, uh, but whether they are actually any use to guide uh, treatment and whether they can actually pick up the cancer growing more. So the reason to do it would be you're on your, you have your scan and then you're on your tablet and you're watching them every month. And if it goes up, you do another scan, but you know, are they good enough to do it in this context? I'm not sure. Okay. All right, lovely. Um, I was there was one here in terms of um, uh, NGS testing, um, liquid and uh, liquid biopsy, um, biopsies, um, mm -hmm. differences and and pros and cons. So liquid biopsy, very easy, very quick. Um, you take your blood, uh, no labs involved. If you send it off to a company, there's a number of them out there. You'll get your results in about two weeks time. Uh, no need to go for a biopsy. So very quick uh, problems with that. And, and the, the other thing is, you know, it gives you a nice up to date picture of a global what's going on, not in the brain, but what's going on in the rest of the body. Disadvantages is you need to have enough DNA to pick up. Um, and that's often a problem, particularly if it's only progressing in one or two areas, you just don't get enough, particularly if it's progressing in the lungs, the lungs sort of act as a bit of a sponge to the DNA. So it's more common that you'll pick it up if it's the disease is active in like bones or liver. Second thing is it's not as good at picking up fusions as it is at mutations. So out fusions in themselves can often be missed, but if you're looking at for something like a ret fusion, you won't pick that up. Oh, you, no, you can't guarantee to pick it up. It's more difficult, it's less sensitive for those. And the last thing is it won't pick up that change from of the cancer type. So if you're going from a non-small cell to a small cell, it won't be picked up on liquid biopsy. You have to have a piece. Okay. Right. It's also not funded in the NHS at present time. It costs about three thousand pounds a pop. Um, sometimes your consultant can get it for free. I can get it for free for about the next three weeks, and then I'm not going to be able to get it for free anymore. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, and I think we've just got time for one last question. Um, so um, I'm just having a quick scan in terms of here's one that's come up quite a few times because of the differences in treatment availability in the US because they do. Uh, uh, non nice approved treatment uh, treatment approaches in the US. Is it possible to go to the US to get treatment that is not available in the UK? You, you, well, you can you can go, but you'll have to pay for it. Um, it's not going to be funded. So the the NHS will very occasionally fund treatments in another country. The the classic example was we didn't used to have um, proton beam therapy for the young kids for brain tumors, so they used to go over to Germany. Uh, we now do, so they stay in the UK, but they're not going to fund for you to go over to America and the costs will be absolutely outrageous. You know, um, not only the the uh, uh, medical costs, but drugs actually often cost more in America. Um, so, yeah, you know, you would need a significant amount of money to do that, even to go on a trial, I'm afraid. OK, all right. Thank you very much. I'm just having a look and I haven't seen any questions come through on the chat. 
So I think people have just been too busy listening to you, Alistair, but we have hit um, seven o'clock. So I'm going to suggest that we finish here. I'd like to say thank you very much indeed for your time this evening. Um, and I hope that everyone's uh, enjoyed this evening and we will um, hopefully we'll have a few. Well, we've got another uh, meeting in, um, in very soon, coming up very soon. But um, thank you very much indeed for tonight, Alistair. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.